I'm super excited for our next speaker, uh, Dan Spaulding. He is the Vice President, Head of People and Culture at Zillow, and they really, really care about that. And prior to that, he was at the VP at Starbucks, U.S. Store and Retail Operations, and then before that, VP of Global Communication Operations, HR at Life Technologies. So let's give uh, Dan a big round of applause. Welcome. Thank you. Yeah. There's your clicker. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, and uh, thanks to TinyCon for inviting uh, Zillow Group here to share a little bit of our story. And as I've, you know, kind of sat today and listened to a lot of the conversation, what I've really enjoyed is the focus on how you're trying to scale your business to meet either your employees' needs or your business challenges. And Zillow has, I think, some really in inspirational stories to share in terms of how we've moved from tiny startup to a mid-sized company and how we're working with really intentional decisions to maintain that culture that, that was started 11 years ago by the founders and is something that we're trying to scale today to multiple sites across the US and, and close to 3,000 employees. So first, we will start about what Zillow Group is. Because in Seattle, everybody calls us Zillow. Uh, but that's actually not what our name is. Our name is Zillow Group. And we are, of course, the place that you go if you want to snoop on the value of your neighbor's house or on how much your brother-in-law actually spent on his house. Uh, but we do a lot more than just provide a place where you can go and look at real estate prices. We actually have really a, a, a dual strategy as a business. The first is our consumer brands, which are really focused not on selling homes, but on connecting people who either want to buy or rent a home with people who sell or rent properties. Uh, and a lot of people always ask us, are we like you know, this company that is a broker, or are we like this internet company? Really, we're in the business of making connections and providing data and really creating transparency in the market. And then on the bottom, you see we've got B2B brands that probably, unless you're a real estate agent or come from that industry, you've probably never heard of, where we're also working to really digitize, automate, and simplify the real estate process for brokerages and for, uh, and for real estate agents. And I'm going to talk in a little bit about why that's so important that what we're doing on the top of this page with the brands that you may know like Zillow and Trulia and Hot Pads isn't conflicting with the work that we're trying to do to really provide the, the most significant value that we can to our business or to our customers. So I'm new at Zillow Group. And I've been there for about six months from when I came from a, another little, little company called Starbucks that's headquartered here in Seattle. Uh, and like a lot of HR professionals in the room, uh, I started and there were a number of opportunities uh, that the leadership team needed me to jump into right now. And how was I going to jump in and kind of manage my day and all of the issues that the team wanted me to jump into, while at the same time learning the business, building relationships, making connections. And so, you know, you jump in, you've got a bunch of meetings, the CEO asks you to set up a meeting to talk about something, what do you do? You look on Outlook, because uh, I didn't have my assistant yet, uh, you look on Outlook and you try to set up a meeting. And I scheduled a meeting for 5.30 p.m. on a Tuesday. A couple of the key players in the organization. Uh, and suddenly I start, you know, really important topic. And I get a bunch of declines. I'm like, okay, well, guess everybody must be busy. So then I resent the invite for 6 p.m. Uh, and I got a call from one of our... Uh, founding executives, uh, and that person, who I, I won't reveal their name or, or their gender since some of the teams in the room, said, oh yeah, Dan, uh, Zillow Group, we didn't actually just kind of patter on about work-life balance in your interview process to attract you to work here. We actually really care about work-life balance. And if you're going to be at Zillow Group, and if you're going to be, I don't know, the head of culture at Zillow Group, you probably shouldn't be scheduling meetings for 5.30 p.m. And I was like, huh, that's interesting. Uh, and so that kind of started me then stay, stepping back and actually getting terrified on the inside because then I realized, 
okay, my title's people and culture. I'm really comfortable on the people side. I've been doing that for like 17 years in the corporate world. Uh, then I was like, oh, culture. Yay, I have to steer the culture. And how am I gonna do that in an organization where all of the people who define the culture are still in the building? So, took me back to really discovering kind of the early days of Zillow. And for those of you who aren't Seattle natives, Zillow was founded uh, by two leaders, Rich Barton uh, and Lloyd Frank, who were also the co-founders of Expedia. And before Expedia, they actually came up with the idea for Expedia while they were engineers within Microsoft. And by the time they founded Zillow in 2005, and they founded Zillow in 2005 because they were really frustrated with where do they go to get information on the housing market, right? Uh, you know, if you kind of think back, you know, 10 years ago, you kind of had to go to somebody to get that information, and you were always just playing this game of, uh, you know, kind of trying to find Pikachu. Uh, you, you were looking for the information, and you hoped that it popped up with the right person. They really wanted to change that. But they also really wanted to change the way that their employees felt about work. They had been through the cycle of, of a startup and building a company. They didn't want a company that burned people out by working them 24 hours a day, even though they were trying to launch, grow, and scale a business. So they really said, hey, work-life balance, it's going to be something that's really important to us. And how did they manifest that? Well, at Zillow Group, we don't really set meetings before 9 a.m. in the morning, and we don't set meetings after 4.30 in the afternoon. Now, we don't tell our employees that, like, you don't have to show up till 9, p 9 a.m. or you can leave at 4.30 p.m. We believe in choice, and we believe in treating people like adults. But we also believe that we want an intense work environment that gets things done during the day so we can get out of the office. Unlike a lot of other startups, we don't bring in meals, we don't bring in dinner, we have killer snacks, uh, but we, we try to encourage our employees to drive a very intense experience in their day and then go home. And, and frankly, I've had to change the way that I operate because I'm an HR professional who like, I roll in at 7 a.m., I'll stay till 6 p.m. Uh, and so I've lost kind of that time in my day. So it's more intense, but it was very clear from literally my first week, they weren't messing around about their, the decisions that they've intentionally made around what they value as an organization and how they're trying to embed and really maintain that as they've moved from five people founding Zillow 11 years ago to almost 3,000 employees today. And the thing that you, know, you highlight with that is every company out there I'm sure on their website at this point, says that we believe in work-life balance. But it's taking all of this feedback that we get through Tiny Pulse and, and, and the other ways that you get feedback and really embedding that in your culture and making those intentional decisions that they're going to make sure that whether you're a C-suite executive or a brand new person in our call center in Denver, that you understand that, yes, it's an intense and work environment, Yes, we want, to, you know, we want you there, we want you to be present, but at the end of the day, we actually want you to get out of work, we want you to go home, and we want you to make the choices about where and how you're gonna get your work done. We just expect to get the work done. Now, the way that we've embedded and made a lot of our decisions is around the core values that the founders of the company set when they, they founded the company. Actually, they set them about, I think, about three years into found, founding the company. But what's really important that I, I, I want to give you some examples of today to walk away with is how you make intentional decisions around your core values that really amplify your culture or detract from your culture. And I think it's fairly relevant because, again, I can't take credit for the core values. Um, I can't take credit for a lot of what I'm about to walk you through. But what I do understand and what has made my transition into the organization over the last six months a lot easier is the fact that I actually don't have to ask a lot of people at this point, what's our North Star? And how do we make decisions? Because it's related to our core values, but then it also comes back to treating people like adults, giving them choice, 
and then living with the outcomes of treating people like adults and giving them choice. So what do I mean by that? I'm going to take you through each of these core values, and I'm going to give you a quick hit example in our culture of how we try to amplify that core value and how we try to tie it back to that intentional decision making that we want to make from the senior most executives down to our employees every day. So acting with integrity. Everybody says this. Why is this really important to Zillow? Well, I'm going to show you our mission statement. Build the largest, most trusted, and vibrant home-related marketplace in the world. Anybody in here been a real estate agent by any chance? Were you a real estate agent when Zillow existed? Did you like Zillow? Yeah, there you go. You shrug your shoulders. A lot of real estate agents, a lot of brokers, are worried that Zillow exists and that our business exists to take their business away, that we're going to commoditize home selling, that we're going to find a way to cut out brokers and real estate agents. So one of the things that the organization is acutely attuned to in our employment culture is that trust has to be at the center of everything we do, because if it's not, it's not going to show up to our customers. It's not going to show up to the consumers who are going on the website to look at the value of their home. It's not going to show up to the real estate agents and the brokers that we want to build deep relationships with. So we try to establish a level of trust within our mission that's very clear for our employees. If you look at any of the media that, that Zillow Group does, um, we try to emulate a lot of what Amazon tries to do. We don't think about our business quarter to quarter. Yes, we have shareholders. Yes, we're a public company. Yes, we have targets that we want to hit. But we want to take actions that build trust with our employees. We want to take actions that build trust with the external market. And if that's at the sacrifice of a short-term decision to better position the company for the long term, we'll actually do that. And it's something that we'll actually talk to Wall Street about. And Wall Street doesn't always like that, but it's something we take great pride in but it's set a level of trust now that we have with our employees that we're working on, of course, continuing to maintain and scale as we've gone from five people to 50 people to 100 people to close to 3,000 people today. So move fast, think big. If I rewound the clock about 18 months, we were just Zillow here in Seattle. Uh, and we were probably about 500, 500 employees. Then we went on an M&A uh, purchasing spree. We bought a number of companies. The chief uh, amongst those was the Trulia brand, which is based in San Francisco. So this core value, move fast, think big, that's really self-explanatory. We want to be fast. We're, we're a startup. We want to maintain the big thinking that, that got Zillow to where it was. But we run into really hard M&A realities. And I'll give you an example of one of those realities. Trulia, like a lot of companies in the Bay Area, based a lot of its equity compensation on RSUs, restricted stock units. Zillow, here in Seattle, uh, really built their compensation philosophy almost entirely around stock options. Now, for any HR professional in here or business leader who's done an acquisition, the way you usually manage uh, the integration of compensation and benefits is you decide who's going to kind of win. And guess who usually wins? The company that's doing the acquisition. Well, we asked ourselves, OK, our employees are used to two different forms of compensation. How do we reconcile that? Well, guess what? We don't reconcile it. We give them the choice to get compensated the way that they want to get compensated in their equity package. So now if you're an HR professional or a comp professional, you can grab me afterwards and I can take you through that. But when we make our annual equity awards to every employee in Zillow Group, so these are from our people in our call center taking agent phone calls to our dev engineers uh, here in Seattle or in San Francisco, we actually give them entire control over do they take their equity award in RSUs or do they take their equity award in stock options. Now, what's funny about this from a cultural perspective is RSUs and stock options work very differently. Stock options can give you, this is non-Zillow perspective, this is Dan's perspective, but stock options over time can give you far more significant upside. RSUs, far more guaranteed cash. 
So it's, you know, there's a little bit of a trade-off there that employees are making. And some of our founders are so passionate about generating wealth for our employees, they're like, why would you ever take restricted stock? But sometimes they forget that our employees are 28 and they're trying to buy their first condo in really competitive, uh, in really competitive housing markets. But what they did recognize is that they had an opinion and their opinion was about their choice. We wanna give our employees the choice and then we're gonna live with the decision that they make. So even though some of our leaders really want people to be all in with stock options and think big about the future, they now understand, hey, you know what? My view of compensation is not necessarily my employee's view of compensation, and we wanna enable more decision in the hands of our employees. Uh, own it, obviously I think that's pretty self-explanatory. One of the ways that we're trying to address this is through uh, discretionary time off. So I know this is a hot topic in the HR community um, in terms of do you do vacation accruals for exempt level employees or do you let them have sort of guardrails and use discretionary time off? Well again, if we want our employees to own the success of the company, if we want to believe in uh, work-life balance and valuing their work and their life equally, we want to demonstrate to our employees that we trust them, that we treat them like adults, and that we let them make the decision about their time off. That doesn't mean, Edzillo, that you can take like three months off if you want. Of course we have, uh, I, I mean, we've got the HR team here, right? We, we, we've got some rules and some guidelines around it, but ultimately we know that our employees, whether they're somebody who wants to take a lot of long weekends during the summer off, or somebody who wants to desperately travel with their friends for Europe, you know, in Europe two weeks out of the core of the summer, that giving them the choice to do that is what's going to amplify our culture the most, and it's something that we want to continue to invest in. So I know, I, I, actually, I, some of the organizations that were here, we've been talking about this in Seattle. I welcome anytime you've got questions about this. Um, is it easy? It's not always easy. We've had to learn our way through how to manage this uh, really successfully. But our employees consistently give us the feedback that we treat them like adults, and they appreciate that. Uh, this one I am really excited about because I have uh, had the opportunity to be a big part of it uh, with my coworker Karina, who's who's in the audience. Zilla Group's a team sport. So what? You know, that again is self-explanatory in the core value, and like most startups, these core values are everywhere you look in our offices around the country. But the challenge that we've got now is we're a startup that suddenly has over 400 people in management and leadership positions across the US uh, and up in Vancouver. And so we're at that point in our growth where we have to start giving more guidance and direction to our managers as to how we want them to lead in the vein of our culture. And we had a lot of debates internally around how to do this. And you know, a lot of those debates ended with manager training. Um, well, there's nothing less startup feeling than manager training. So we set, us, we set out uh, you know, about seven, eight months ago, so I kind of came in right in the middle of the process, where we actually went out and we talked to all levels of the company, all job functions, we used all the available data sources that we had to really humanize what do great leaders within Zillow Group do, how do they treat their employees, and then we distilled that down into four core principles around leadership, and then we put those leadership principles into a playbook that we are going to take every manager through in the next uh, about seven weeks. And instead of telling them to lead like I would lead or lead like Rich Barton or Spencer Raskoff or Amy Batinsky, you know, some of our, our founding leaders, we're actually trying to stress some human language and some really detailed examples of how they can amplify the aspects of their own leadership that they're either strong at or give them really, really clear examples of how they can go and amplify areas where they've got opportunity. But again, what we're gonna stress with them is it's not about doing it the way that I would do it or do it the way that another leader would do it. It's about doing it in a way that's authentic to them, to their team, and to the mission that they're trying to accomplish as a team. So it's a playbook 
for you sports fanatics in the room, it literally is a number of different scenarios and situations and then leaving it to our managers and trusting them enough that they want to do the best thing for their team, that they can put together the best plan for them. And of course, our team behind them to support them in that process. Oops, I forgot to do my build. So it's a framework for being a leader, but embracing individual leadership styles, because that's the piece that we continue to find. Nobody as the company gets bigger just wants to apply the same approach and the same style. All right, finally, this is like confession time. I don't use, we don't use Tiny Pulse. We don't use it yet. It's something that we, we love Tiny Pulse. They're, they're a great partner for us here in uh, the local Seattle community. We uh, are certainly always evaluating it. I love the Perform platform. I, I really love what, what they're doing. Um, but there are some aspects that, uh, about our culture that we have continued to really manually uh, manage within, within our company. And of course, my job now coming in is how do we scale this as we have aims to become a significantly larger company. But one of our core values is called turning on the lights. Uh, and it's probably my favorite core value. It's what attracted me the most to the company. But we have a deep history since we started with a lot of these employees of being really direct with our employees and really responsive to listening to our employees, taking their advice to heart, and taking action. You know, I think we're the type of culture that is exactly what Tiny Pulse is going to enable, uh, certainly the companies that are in this room, to go and do. But have a platform where you can get that feedback and respond to it real time is something that, uh, you know, again, Karina, who's in the room, helps us to administer this. It's a fairly, uh, fairly traditional survey, but we've scaled so quickly in the last year and a half, we wanted to do some real deep analytics on, on the baseline of, of where we are today. Uh, and then, of course, we're, we're continuing to work with Tiny Pulse and, and, and other folks to, to try to determine really what's the right next step for us in this area. But our employees, actually almost expect us to turn on the lights about things. And uh, we use, of course, our, our, all of these core values with hashtags, and you can go onto Twitter, and you will see our employees communicating to us around hashtags around these core values. And finally, I want to end with our last core value, which is winning is fun. When you give employees choice, when you treat them like adults with very intentional decisions, you get the type of feedback that really is the, the feedback that ultimately matters. And you know, the one I, I would call out on this, uh, Spencer Raskoff was just named uh, one of the highest, one of the 10 highest rated CEOs in the United States uh, via Glassdoor. And he's the type of CEO that goes through every single Glassdoor review that we get from a candidate and from an employee. I am finally getting to the point where I don't cringe every time I see the email from him to me based on the feedback that we, that we get. But honestly, he says it the best on Twitter. Recruiting, retention, when you're talking about those two topics in the markets that we're all existing in today, particularly around engineering and sales talent, it's hand-to-hand -hand combat. It's hearing that single voice, and it's taking action on it. And whether you are a, a, you know, a Tiny Pulse customer, what I love about what we're talking about in this room today is it's getting involved in that individual conversation. And that's the piece that really has, has something that Zillow invested in from the day they were founded. And it's something that we're going to try and continue and amplify in the intentional decisions that we're going to make going forward around our culture. So that's it. All right, that was great. So uh, we're going to uh, have a seat, and we'll take some questions uh, from the audience uh, for Dan. Great job. Oh. Hi. Uh, so my question uh, goes back to the work-life balance conversation. And uh, what have you done or what have you seen done when there's a difference of idea of what work-life balance looks like. So I have one manager, so one of our things is, hey, flexible time. You come in when it works for you and leave when it works for you, work needs to get done. We have one manager who 
prefers a very specific time of work, um, and his employers are kind of running into a, I'm not sure how to handle this. Yeah, I, you know, I feel like I run into that almost on a daily basis. You know, for us, we believe deeply in work-life balance, but we also believe in teams working together. So we don't have a work from home policy unless you're a remote employee. And our philosophy is, hey, we believe in sporadic working from home when that's something you need to do for a doctor's appointment or an event or something that's important to you. Yet every single forum I'm in, uh, every single time that, that we're having this conversation, employees bring it up in terms of you know, this, this tension between, well, we're, we're focused on work-life balance, but you're not telling me that I can work from home every, you know, every Friday. So you know, the answer is we acknowledge that we are far from perfect on, on, on really all of these items, and we try to stick to those core beliefs that we have as an organization, and we just go back to we want to have the conversation. If you and your manager are having trouble determining kind of what's the right balance, um, you know, that's where hopefully my team's involved in that conversation. When it gets to an organizational level, we just, we're really direct and really honest. Hey, we believe in people working from home when they need to. We don't know, necessarily believe that we're at the point where, you know, we can collaborate when people are, you know, well, is, is Sam in today or is Sally off on Mondays? Um, and so we just really, uh, we go back to those core beliefs, we articulate them to, to our employees, and then, you know, if it gets messy, we try to just not avoid the mess and, you know, go in and, and clean it up. And the reality with work-life balance is, of course, it does mean different things in different jobs. There are some jobs where if you're on the phone, we're really clear, this is when your shift is, this is when, you know, you kind of need, you know, need to be in the office. Um, but we also really empower those managers to say, if something violates what, what is working for what that individual employee needs, bring that conversation up and, and let's work through it. And, and that's been the piece that, um, you know, again, I, and I loved working at Starbucks. It's what I loved about Starbucks, too, was it was an environment where the only wrong answer is not having the conversation. I'm Dave from Tiny Pulse. Um, so we have the same thing, unlimited paid time off. And, uh, and sometimes I've only taken one holiday in two years. And every now and then my eyebrows raise when I see people that look like they're taking too many. I'm just curious, how, how do you deal with that situation? When is it too much? That I am personally dealing with. <laughs> you, you know, I, I, I got to admit, you know, I'm, I'm, kind of, I'm six months into it. Um, I am watching kind of my own team dynamics. And you know, the big criticism of discretionary time off is that employees won't take it. And, you know, I don't know necessarily yet whether I believe it's that employees won't take it or depending on the phase of your career in, it's maybe not your highest priority. You know, when I was in the first decade of my career, I can count on two fingers the amount of vacations that I took that were a full work week off. Um, and that was a decision that I intentionally made. Um, now I'm looking at, at, at my team and I'm seeing, you know, I've got one person who's like in Europe for a little over two weeks and I'm like, oh, that makes me really nervous, but that person's an incredible performer. And it, it, it comes back to, I'm really impressed with the work that's getting done. Uh, I, I, they had their work covered before they walked, you know, before they went on the vacation and it's something that's really important to them. And, to really walk the talk around saying that we give you that flexibility, I, I got to kind of deal with a, a little bit of those tension points. Um, and, and so, you know, it, it, I, I believe that there's a strong correlation between if you're not happy in your job and you're not doing well, then you're, you're not going to be performing. Uh, and, and, well, I mean, that's the most obvious thing anybody's ever said. But, uh, <laughs> you know, it, 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 there are usually underlying problems if you're feeling like the performance isn't giving you then the confidence that they can take that time away. And what we're really focused on right now with manager capability is how do you accelerate to the actual issue with the employee? Um, so while it may, it may make me nervous that, uh, you know, some people are maybe taking a little bit more vacation than 
I would feel comfortable taking, again, I have to step back and say, we're trying to be intentional in giving them that choice. And as long as the performance you know, and contribution stays where you know, we need it to be, then, you know, then we got to kind of see, see how it works, even, you know, even when it makes us nervous. And I have found with the couple of places where I'm concerned about it, there also is a performance issue. And so then it's really forcing me to address the real issue. It's not vacation. It's not when they come to work or leave work. It's that I'm getting annoyed about something they're, they are or they aren't doing in their job, and I'm taking it out on the easy example. And that's where I think we've gotten so wrong about work-life balance in, in sort of the US corporate world is we use that as the easy control point with our employees instead of really looking at performance. Hello, I'm Mary from Seattle. Hi, Mary. And I was wondering, uh, with the acquisitions, kind of, you were kind of able to come up with good ways to deal with the different compensation packages. How did you deal with different cultures and kind of blending those together? Yeah, um, I, you know, I would say that's part of why I'm sitting on this stage talking to you. Uh, my background as an HR professional is heavy M&A. Um, and, you know, I, I think we, particularly with the Trulia acquisition, have run into what a lot of scaling startups run into, which is, We've got a great team, we've got core values, we're gonna merge with our biggest rival, and they're just gonna see how awesome we were all the time, and they're gonna, you know, 100%, you know, 100% buy in. And the Trulia team's great, they had a great culture, they had a great business, they've got a unique value proposition in the marketplace. It wasn't that simple. And so while I think we did a really good job on integrating some of the you know, obviously, we've integrated the business models well. Uh, we've integrated a lot of the sales and support. Um, you know, culturally, really making sure that you are amplifying what's best about the new combined culture as opposed to just focusing on the legacy cultures. That's really the art that we're trying to perfect now. And you know, like a lot of companies, we make mistakes and we try to learn from them. And what's great about our leadership team is they recognize where they think they could have done some of the integration work better. And, and, and frankly, our, our biggest priority is we know we're gonna do large scale acquisition uh, and merger work in the future. And we want to really learn from you know, talking to those employees, hearing their voice, hearing what that experience was, um, and, and then really trying to pivot and be, you know, again, those intentional decisions that you make specifically around Communication and cultural integration are huge in M&A. Um, and, and if you want to be successful there, you, you can't be unidirectional with, with that conversation. Just quick question about the, um, the work-life balance thing. So, so no, no meetings before 9, no meetings after 4.30. How many hours roughly a week do people work there? And how does that compare to Starbucks? I'm just curious. Uh, I did say that there are never a meeting before <laughs> 9 or 4.30. Um, but in general, we don't schedule meetings before then. Uh, you know, I think the working hours is, is a very interesting question. Again, we want it to be a choice of the individual. We have engineers who are your, your, your kind of maybe prototypical engineers that roll into work at 10 and we'll stay playing video games in our video game den and ping pong and all the things that a startup tech culture has, uh, you know, they'll stay till 10 o'clock at night at work. Uh, I'm a runner and I have kids, so I'm still, I still roll into the office about 7.30 in the morning. We try to, again, focus less on the hours and more on the outcome that you're trying to drive, but being respectful that particularly in our two largest cities, Seattle and San Francisco, we've got people who are dealing with dual working careers, childcare pickup and drop off issues, and increasingly insane commutes um, from, you know, Seattle and San Francisco are fairly similar, you know, in, in those areas as well. So 
we try to kind of put all that in the mix and let people make decisions. You know, we have our hourly employees that need to get their hourly, you know, to get their hours. Um, but we really believe in the power of the internet and we really believe in the power of cell phones. And, you know, again, um, you know, I've got members of my team who they're, they're night owls and, you know, they like to get on at 10 p.m. And, and send me emails and they know that I am a runner. So I'm, I go to bed at 10 p.m. And, and we just, you know, we just deal with that. But, you know, we certainly, it, it has taken me some getting used to. Our offices are like dead by 5 p.m which is so different for me. And what I'll say about Starbucks, Starbucks is an early bird culture. Uh, Starbucks does the vast majority of their business Imagine before that. 9 a.m. Uh, you, you were late if you were getting into the office ar around 7 a.m. But the thing I will say about Starbucks that, that was just fantastic is it was, uh, you know, it was a culture that knew it was an early culture, so it wasn't a late culture too, um, and, and really, really supported their employees from that perspective. But oh my God, was it an early culture. Yeah. <laughs> it tested me. I say I'm an early bird. Saying you're an early bird and like being in like strategy meetings at seven in the morning <laughs> is a different thing. Luckily, you were very caffeinated in the process. Yeah. Well, well great. So um, thank you, Dan. Uh, that was awesome. And um, thank you. Yeah.